Shall we now begin our worship of God by singing to his praise in Psalm 103? Psalm 103, and we shall sing from verse 11. Psalm 103, sing from verse 11. For as the heaven in its height, the earth surmounteth far, so great to those that do in fear his tender mercies are. As far as east is distant from the west, so far hath he from us removed in his love all our iniquity. Such pity as a father hath unto his children dear, like pity shows the Lord to such as worship him in fear. For he remembers we are dust, and he our frame well knows. Frail man, his days are like the grass, as flower and field he grows. For over it the wind doth pass, and it away is gone. And off the place where once it was, it shall no more be known. But unto them that do in fear, God's mercy never ends. And to their children's children still, his righteousness extends. These verses of Psalm 103 sing from verse 11, For as the heaven in its height, the earth surmounted far. Let us pray. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst accept our worship this morning. It is a responsibility, a duty, and a privilege that thy creatures can worship thee. And they can worship thee not only because of who thou art, 
But thou hast exhorted all thy creatures are to praise thee. The whole creation is to praise and to glorify thee. For everything was made, not in the first instance for the benefit of creation, but for thy glory. And thou dost take delight when that which thou hast created for thy glory, and particularly man who is made in thine image, and who can be called the crown of creation, how he has got an especial duty and privilege to call upon thee in worship, to praise thee. And we pray, Lord, that our worship this day would be according to thy prescript and acceptable to thee. Thou hast not left us in ignorance. Thou hast not left us to, va to devise our own means of approaching thee. This is what men do. Thy word, we, we read of will worship, which is man deciding himself how he is to worship God. But if thou hast given us direction as thou hast, what is pleasing to thee, then we must follow what thou hast laid down for us in thy word. We do not do so in perfection. We may do it outwardly regarding the form, but we always come short regarding the spirit. For our worship is to be in spirit and in truth. We have the truth of thy word, but we must also worship thee in spirit. And no matter how much we worship thee in spirit, it is never perfect. Because in this world, we are not perfect. And therefore, all oh, the outward worship in form may be according to thy word, it must be, there must be that inward spiritual worship. We must worship thee in our hearts and with our hearts and not with our lips only. We pray, Lord, as we come, we would come seeking to acknowledge thy perfections, thy attributes which are perfect and which should control and should be in our thoughts as at any, every time we come before thee in prayer and in worship. We think, O Lord, of the attributes of thy holiness, which we have been seeking to consider in recent times, the holiness of God. And that seems to be the, the attribute that is revealed to us firstly. Although all thy attributes are glorious, uh, thou art a God who is glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. And we pray therefore, Lord, that our worship would uh, reflect that and would acknowledge that. As we come, O Lord, and as we consider thy holiness, we cannot but consider our own unholiness. We are so different from thee, not only in that we are limited and finite, but in our moral characters. Thou art perfect, and we are born in sin, and shapen in iniquity. And we might not wish to confess that or acknowledge that, but thy word tells us, and our experience should also confirm it, that that is how we are in this world. But we thank thee, Lord, that thou art, although thou art a holy God, and thou art a just God, thou art also a merciful God, and thou art a God of love. And because thou art a merciful God and a God of love, thou didst provide for forgiveness of sin, a way whereby we could be delivered from the guilt and the power of sin. And that is through the gospel, through the good news of the gospel. For thou didst so love the world that thou didst give thine only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is... The way of life, that is, what, that is the one thing needful, that we should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The whosoever believes shall be saved. Whosoever does not believe shall be condemned. We pray, therefore, Lord, that we would be wise unto salvation, that we would look unto thee in faith and in repentance, turning from our sin and looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for his righteousness, which is a perfect righteousness, and which um, we receive by faith, and which is, which is imputed to us, and um, imputed to us and received by faith alone. Pray therefore thou wouldst bless us, and bless each one of us gathered here. We thank thee that there are those who gather here from time to time to wait upon thee. And we pray that they and we would do so in a way that honors thee. 
We do not we, we do not know the end from the beginning. Thou dost know. Thou dost know all things. Thou dost know what the future holds for each one of us. And we pray, Lord, therefore we would commit our ways unto thee, and that, that thou would direct our steps. And when we commit our ways unto thee, and when we they have been united to the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we love thee, then we are also the called according to thy purpose. And when we are, and if we are those, then thou art the one who is working in this world, according to thy great providence, thy great power and providence, and the providence that thou dost work in this world on behalf of thy people, is a good providence. Everything that comes into the lives of thy people is for their good in ways that we cannot understand. Sometimes we can, we, we see, we believe we can see the goodness of God, the way his promises work for us. But soft in thy providence is mysterious. Thou dost work in ways that we cannot understand. There are mysteries, the mystery of providence. And yet, uh, by faith, we believe that whatever happens to us is for our good. Thou can even make, uh, thou dost even bring good out of evil. Not that that excuses evil or sin in our behalf, but if we sin uh, seeking to comfort ourselves, knowing that thou art the one who is working everything for good, that is a, a grievous sin of presumptuous, of presumption, a presumptuous sin. And thou wilt sorely trust, chastise us for it. But we pray, therefore, Lord, that we would come with that confession of sin and thanking thee above all, all else, for that one thing needful, that we are accepted by thee. We pray, Lord, for each person gathered here at this time. Thou dost know our circumstances, each one. There is much that is known to our fellow men, but there are many things that are not known to our fellow men, things that we keep to ourselves, and there are some things we should keep to ourselves. Uh, but they are all known unto thee. And we pray, therefore, Lord, that thou wouldst bless us according to our needs. Pray that bless this congregation at this time as they are without a pastor. And we pray that they would acknowledge that thou art the one who provides pastors and teachers for their building of the body of Christ. And we pray, O Lord, that they would be in a position at some time to call such a one to take charge of, of them as a congregation. Uh, take charge of their souls, to go in amongst them, to break unto them the bread of life. And we pray, Lord, that they would have faith, that they would have patience in these matters and faith, seeking to walk before thee in all obedience and righteousness, know, and knowing that uh, if we seek thy honor, thou wilt, uh, thou wilt honor us. Those that honor thee, thou wilt honor. We pray for the gospel preached in these parts and throughout our land, throughout the world. We thank thee the gospel is still being preached and in, many, in places which we know nothing of. But we know that it is being preached and uh, thy word assures us that it will continue to be preached until the end of the age. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world and then the end shall come. And that is happening at this time. And uh, we thank thee, Lord, that thou art a God who has told us in some measure what the future holds. We do not know the times and the seasons, but we do know that there is, there is that which is, is to take place and is taking place in this world. And we know that the preaching of the gospel is uh, one of those signs of the, of the end of the age, and we are witnessing it in our own day and generation. And uh, we also read of a great apostasy and we are living in an apostasy. There is more than one apostasy. There was the apostasy of the Middle Ages, and there's now the apostasy, sadly, overtaking those churches that have their origins in the Reformation, when they have rejected the authority and the veracity of the Bible, the Word of God. And we see the effect of that sad in our own land, a land that knew the Reformation, that knew the Gospel but has turned it back upon it. And sadly, it's largely because of the, the apostasy and the unbelief that arose within the professing church itself. It grieves us, O Lord, to say these things, but these things are true. And until there is a return to the Bible as the Word of God, we cannot see any betterment for us as a nation, as communities, as individuals. We are as sheep without a shepherd. 
And we have hewn out for ourselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. And until we return unto thee, thou wilt not return unto us. But we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst return unto us. And when thou dost work amongst us and restore to us the years that the locusts have eaten, then we do turn unto thee in faith and in repentance. And we think once again, O Lord, of events that are before us at this time, events that are taking place in the Middle East. The Bible tells us clearly that the Jewish people have a great part in the history of this world that is still not being fully realized. And we are encouraged, O oh Lord, when we read in thy word that they will be grafted in again. That has not happened. But we, it may be that that is about to happen and we should be praying to that end. And uh, it should be a great encouragement to us when we see the way thou dost preserve this people. They are being preserved in unbelief and in rebellion against thee, but they are being preserved for this end, that thou wilt have mercy upon them. When they shall, and when thou dost remove the veil from their eyes, and they shall see Christ as the true Messiah, and they shall mourn for him, and turn unto him in faith and repentance. We pray thou therefore bless us. Bless us as we turn to thy word. We thank thee for thy word, which is true, which is able to make us wise unto salvation. Bless us now, we pray, and forgive and cleanse us from all sin. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Shall we now continue to worship God by singing to his praise in Psalm 119? Psalm 119 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 119 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. Blessed are they that undefiled I beg your pardon, sorry, Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. Let God arise and scatter, let all his enemies be. And let all those that do him hate before his presence flee. As smoke is driven, so drive thou them, as fire melts wax away. Before God's face let wicked men so perish and decay. And so on down to the end of verse 6. Psalm 68, singing from the beginning. Let God arise and scattered, let all his enemies be.
So we now read in the New Testament, the Word of God in the New Testament and the Gospel of Matthew and reading again in chapter 6. The Gospel of Matthew and reading in chapter 6 and we shall read from the beginning of the chapter. Take heed that ye do not your eyes before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine arms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth that ye have need of what you have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But they up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen, and may God add a blessing to that reading of his own word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Shall we now continue to worship God by singing Psalm 119? Psalm 119 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 119 and singing from the beginning. Blessed are they that undefiled them and straight are in the way, who in the law's most holy law do walk and do not stray. Blessed are they who to observe the statutes are inclined, and who do seek the living God with their whole heart and mind. And so on, the whole of this section down to verse 8, Psalm 119 from the beginning. Blessed are they that undefiled and straight are in the way.
Shall we now turn again to the chapter we read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and we will look again at the Lord's Prayer. There are a number of petitions in the Lord's Prayer, what we are to pray for. We call these the petitions. But uh, what I should have done uh, in the last Lord's Day morning is say something about uh, the first petition. Now, we talked about hallowed be thy name as the first petition. But before that, there is the address that is given. Uh, this is verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which, which art in here, our Father. That really requires, it's an omission. We should have said something about God as our Father. It's a wonderful truth, that. And um, it's a truth that, uh, like every truth, can be misunderstood. See, there are, there are those who will say, and they do say, God is the Father of all men. He's the Father of all men. And therefore, he loves all men equally, because he's their Father. Now, the Bible does speak, and it's interesting, there are verses, and I'm going to quote some of them here, uh, that do refer to God as the Father of all men, uh, but there's a distinction made. And then there's the references to God as the Father of his, own, of his people, of those who believe in him, who trust him. For instance, we have in Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, have we not all one Father? Now, you might say Malachi there was a Jew, and therefore he was including, he was referring to the Jews. Uh, but he goes on, uh, half we half we not all one father? Now, the, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is contained in the question. The answer is yes, we have all one father. And then he goes on and say, hath not one God created us. Now, this is, the, this is what's important here. He's referring to God as the creator. Hath not one God created us? That really is what he, mean, what he means when he refers to God as Father. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? So that, that is a reference there to God's fatherhood, which I think you could argue goes beyond simply believers. It's, God can be called the Father, a Father because he's the creator. Very important, we should remember. And that, and that is what is referred to by Paul when he was preaching to the Athenians. He makes reference to this when he's dealing with the Athenians. Now, I don't think he uses the term Father, but it really amounts to the same. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all his offspring. All mankind, all men are the offspring of God. Now, the offspring of God is normally referred to as a father. If you're the offspring of someone, that's normally referring to your father. You're the offspring of your father and your mother, of course. So the idea of the universal, what might be called the universal fatherhood of God, there is some truth in it. And I think we've got these scriptures which would, but the distinction to be made is this. We can make a distinction then between God's fatherhood. There is God's fatherhood. We can refer to God as the father by creation. We are all created by God. We're all accountable to God. We're all responsible to God. We're all made in the image of God. And that is a truth that uh, we must acknowledge. And that is whenever Christian missionaries go to preach uh, throughout the world uh, to, to peoples that have different religions, believe in many gods, this is what they can and this is what they must preach. That's what Paul did when he went to the Athenians. They worshipped many gods. They were polytheists, idolaters, worshipping idols, images, and many gods. 
But Paul said he emphasized that we all came from God. He is the creator. He, he, if I was said here, uh, for we are all his offspring. He said more than that. He says that we are one race. I can't recall the exact verse, but we are of one, one race, one, one blood. God has made mankind of one blood. And how, again, we can repeat things, and perhaps we should, but how contradictory all this is to the doctrine of evolution. Doctrine of evolution. Evolution doesn't believe that the human race was made of one blood. It was made of many bloods. And many we've left behind us now in, in our ancestors, our so-called ape-like ancestors. Quite contrary to what the Bible tells us. We're in a one blood, human, human beings. That, that is why they are distinct. And of course, we don't need to go into it. It's interesting that scientists who study these things wonder why is man so distinct when his genes are so close to some other prime, what they call primates. Why is he so distinct? Well, this is why he's distinct. He's made distinct because he's made in the image of God. And not only has he got genes but, and a brain, but he's got a soul. And that's where his, the image of God dwells in his soul. No doubt the brain is involved in, some, in working that out and living it out. But he is made in the image of God because he's God breathed into the breath and he became a living soul. Now that could mean a living being, but he also became a being body and soul. What are we told in Scripture? I forget that you should have checked these verses. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's in, not sure which book it's in, maybe Proverbs. The, the soul, the spirit of, of, the, of, of the beast goes downwards. The spirit of man goes upwards. That's the distinction. There is a spirit in a beast. Obviously, it's something that <laughs> motivates an animal. Something's happening in this, it's got a brain. But uh, it's not the spirit of man, it's not the image of God. So that's the distinction. So that's what we have here. So that is the fatherhood of God by, uh, by creation. Very important to, for us to acknowledge that. But let us, not, let us not misinterpret that. And that is why some say, well, because God is our father, then, as we say, we're all going to be saved. Because our father won't condemn any man. A father won't condemn his child. He loves his child. And of course they should. But that's the first thing. But however, there's a distinction here. And the Bible makes a clear distinction. That if you're a believer, and this is what Christ is, he's teaching his, his followers, his, his disciples to say, our father. And he's not saying... Our Father who created us, that's part of it. It's more than that. The Bible says that believers are the children of God in a special and a peculiar way. Not just by creation, but by adoption. By adoption. They are adopted, we are adopted, we are children of God. By his adoption office. And I'd just like us to quote one or two verses that t t tell us that, t t t t that, that speak about that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. There's a great difference between being created by God and being adopted by God into the family of God. And this is how this is how, this is this is what this is what we're told. Jesus Christ, the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. What a privilege it is for you and I to be members of God's family by adoption. Yes, we should all mankind should acknowledge the privilege they have by being created by God. What a privilege that is. A God who has given us life. All men. And we don't need to touch just now on the promise of God. God is good unto all men. But in the first instance, he gives life to all men. And how thankful then all men ought to be for life. And how thankful they ought to be to God for life. But the believer has an, a, 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 a higher reason 
to be thankful to God because he is not only created, by, but he's a member, he's adopted. I'm the family of God. What are we told? We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is called our elder brother. We are in the family of God, united to Christ, the Son of God, by faith. What a privilege. Then we can go on here, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. That when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That we might receive the adoption of sons. What a wonderful privilege. If you're a Christian, you're a member of the family of God. And what does that mean? It means that God has a special love for you. A family member, a father doesn't have the same love for children outside his own family. Oh, he should have a, a love in, in one sense. But a, a, a parent, a father, has a special love for his own children. And that is what we're told here regarding believers. Sent forth the Son made of woman to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. You see, God has set his love, a saving love, a special love, a saving love and a keeping love. And this to be saved means to be kept as well. That is why you are kept. Again, a pair will seek to protect his child. Now it's true that God in this world protects men, good unto all men. But he doesn't protect, he put it this way, let, let, let's just apply what we've mentioned in prayer and mentioned before. The special love of God, whereby he adopts us into his family. What does that mean? It means that in this world, the promise of God, which is in this world, it affects all men. Paul makes that clear. He said that in in the same sermon at Athens. You see how, how he has appointed the times and the seasons, set the bounds of our habitations, and makes the rain to shine, the sun to fall, the rain to, to fall, the sun to shine, but the just good unto all men. But what are we told in Scripture, Romans chapter 9, isn't it? That God is working in his providence. So far as his people are concerned, for so far as those who love him are concerned, so far as those who are called according to his purpose, that is effectually called according to his purpose, so far as he's working all things together for their good. Why? Because they are his children. They're his adopted children. He's their father in heaven. And he wants to provide and he desires, he delights to provide and to give good gifts unto his children. What a privilege if you're a Christian. How privileged you are. Yes, you should be thankful for human parents, human fathers, and particularly if they're Christian, even more thankful. But what I, human, and that of course is also part of God's provision. That was part of God's provision. If you had parents, good parents, and Parents can be good in a sense, in large measure, without being true Christians. But how much more if they're true Christians? How thankful you ought to be for having a caring parents, responsible parents, but also Christian parents. You should be thankful. But not only have you got Christian parents, if you're a believer, you've got, you've got God as your parent, as your father, and you as his child. What a privilege. And in, the, in this world, he's making provision for you. And at that provision, there's a distinction. This is where the distinction is seen between God as creator and God as father by adoption. Or children, be children of God by creation and be children of God by adoption. This is where the distinction is seen. It's in his providence. Again, we could say, and as much we could say, we said, how God is working all things together for our good. 
Many things in my life in the past, no doubt in the present, I don't understand. I don't understand the things I wouldn't have chosen for myself. But many of these, and the longer I live, many of these in the past, I can see, the, well, we see the hand of God in everything, but the good hand of God. How these things were for my good. I was kept from many things, things I may have desired, but I've been, they've been kept from me. Because God knows that it wouldn't be for my good to receive them or to get them. You can become puffed up. Puffed up. You can be proud of attaining certain things or enjoying certain things or possessing certain things and so on. But here we have it here. Uh, the distinction here. And that is why it, at the beginning of this, that's why we should have said something about it. We first, we cannot address God, we must address God as our Father. Now there's other verses there uh, that I'll mention here and too, but we've covered it main teaching, but I'll just mention some of the other verses. And these have been taken from the larger catechism. As I said, it's a wonderful resource, wonderful source of knowledge, teaching, the larger and the shorter catechism. Then we have here Psalm 103 verse 13. Have we, have we sang that one? No, we haven't sang it. Psalm 103, verse uh, 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Like a father pitieth his children. A true father will pity his children, will feel sorry for them, sympathize with them, help them as he can. And that is what we're told God does. And God does that in a way that far exceeds what any human father can do. It's interesting, I'm not a parent, but many parents, parents do love their children. Most parents do. And they would love to do good for their children, but sometimes they cannot. They don't have the means. They're limited. They would love to be able to do more for their children. Children maybe who is unwell, or, ha or whatever, whatever problems, may have physical problems. Parents would love to. It's interesting, I've just uh, come, came to mind these, often think about what's happening in Israel and remember some of these hostages. I remember a father being interviewed. Very moving. Some is very I find it very moving. And his wife and his two children they were uh, were taken hostages. And you probably remember seeing him. He was there, obviously he was emotional, but he was pleading pleading with these Terrorists, not to harm his girls. He had two wee girls, not to harm them. He says, take me, he says. Take me. That's what he said. Take me, I'll, I'll go. Let them go, and I'll go in their place. And he meant it. I'm quite sure he meant it. That is a, that's a father. Now, he, was, he wasn't a Christian. But he'd be a Jew. He would have known something of the Old Testament. He would have known this verse. <laughs> he would have known Psalm 103, like pity as a father. He, he showed pity unto his children and his wife. And he was prepared to take their place. That, that's, but what about God? Well, we'll come to this. <laughs> we, 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 now's the time to mention it. How, 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 much do, how much does God pity you and I? How much did he pity you and I? This is how much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Christ. He gave his own son. That's how much he pitied sinners. And but we're talking here about those who belong to him. That's how much God pitied them. He gave his own son. You almost might say in one sense, God, be careful I would say this, because God cannot suffer. But in one sense you could say he gave himself, because Christ, you see, is God. You've got to be careful. When Christ was on the cross, he was God and man, and he was not suffering in his deity, deity cannot suffer. He was suffering in his humanity. But there was one person. There weren't two persons. There was one person. Two natures and one person. Mysteries there. That's how much God, the Father, pitieth his children. And you can apply it. If you're a Christian, a believer, that's how much he pitieth you and pitieth me. What a privilege for you and I have. As believers, Psalm 103, let, let us, uh, Matthew, 
Malachi 3, yeah, we've read this recently, Malachi 3, verse 17. And they shall be mine. This is God speaking of his people. Saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. God has spared you. If you're a believer, you've been spared by God. Why have you been spared? You've been spared from the pains of hell. And so have I. You haven't been spared from judgment. You've not been spared from judgment. We must all face the judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done to the body. But you've been spared the pains of hell. That, in that day when he makes a, you shall spare them as a man spares his own son. You'll be spared in that day. You will be openly acknowledged and acquitted if you're a believer. Why? Because you are a member of the family of God. You're adopted into his family. What a privilege. Surely each one of us here, that's what we, sure that's where we would wish to be. We would wish to be part of the family of God by adoption. And it's through faith in Christ. When you believe in the gospel, when you believe in Christ, repent of sin, and receive and rest upon Christ alone for salvation, you are adopted into, at that moment, you are adopted into, if you're not a, Put it this interesting, again, we don't want to spend too much time with speculative questions. There are some who might say that if God has loved his people from, an, from eternity as he has, I have loved you with an everlasting love, then surely they were God's children. They were adopted in eternity. Well, put it this way. When, when I was born into this world and you, you were born in sin and shape and iniquity, and you and I were children of wrath even as others. And it's only when we are called, when we're effectually called, that we become members of God's family. Oh, by it, but by his decree, it is appointed. But it doesn't actually happen until we are effectually called. Bear that. Some have, people, we can all be speculative and end up in views that are heretical. The confession talks about that quite clearly. Although, God has loved his people and elected them from all eternity. They don't actually, they're not regenerated and they don't actually become the sons of God until they're effectually called. And they're, they're certainly not forgiven. They're not forgiven uh, until we repent but, 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 uh, when we, we confess our sin. Let, let us just maybe finish up some other references here. Malachi, Luke 11, verse 11 and 13. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father. Well, there are fathers here. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? The answer again, a rhetorical question, he won't. Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent that would harm the, harm the son? Obviously not. Or if he shall ask an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? And that's according to human nature. We're not talking here of, of Christian people. Some perverse parents might, and some, sadly, some perverse parents do harm their children. No, and it seems that they would do it, fearful thought that they do it knowingly and intentionally. It's a fearful thing, but thankfully, there is natural affection in the heart of men. That's how the world is able, to, that's how the human race is able to exist and continue. What if every parent, did, what if no parents had natural affection? The human race couldn't, the families wouldn't continue. Human race couldn't continue. That's part of the common grace of God. And that's what we're told of here. These are people, this is called the common grace of God. Heathen people don't give their children serpents to kill them or scorpions. If ye, there, if ye there being evil, then being evil, know how to give good gifts. And notice what he's saying, ye being evil. He's talking about fallen man. <laughs> you see, these are, these are deeds that are done by evil people. We are 
natural evil. Fallen man. Fallen man. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father? This is God. God's special providence. Working all things together for good. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? The Holy Spirit. Third person of the Trinity. God gives the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be given the Holy It means to be indwelt, for the Holy Spirit to live in you. Great mystery there, but a great truth. Any time you, I'll put it this way, uh, well, even unbelievers can resist temptation at times. I think we've got to say that. Even unbelievers can resist temptation at times, although they're still under the power of sin. But when you res if you as a believer, when you are able to resist temptation, which is strong, powerful temptation, we think of the think of Joseph. We've said this before. How was Joseph able to resist temptation? Because of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, living in us, enabling us to resist temptation, taking the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith. Faith is a gift of, of God, and it, it's from the Holy Spirit. That's how we're able to resist temptation. And that's what God gives to his children. One might say, they, it's by the Holy Spirit that we believe and repent. And it's, it's the Holy Spirit that applies the salvation to us, the salvation purchased by Christ is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're told, and that's what you have received if you're a believer. You have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if thou be evil, how much more then will, uh, will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And then it's just this final one, I just, it's, it's added, maybe adding something to it. Jeremiah chapter 3, I think it's verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? And here's another reference to the Old Testament to Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, my father? Thou art the guide of my youth. We've said this often before, how often people sadly, mistakenly, wrongly downgrade the Old Testament believers. They regard them as second class believers. Second class. Now it's true we have more privilege in one sense. But many of these believers in the Old Testament, they use their privileges far better than we've used ours. How often have we talked about Job? Well, here is Jeremiah. Here is Jeremiah. Uh, my father, thou art the guide of my youth. He knew God as his father. And indeed, I'm just thinking, remember how we're told, we should have mentioned this. Remember, we're told that we cry we, we address God as Abba, Father. Pro that's probably the word. I didn't check it, but when it says my father, that's probably the, the Hebrew, Abba is a Hebrew word. That's probably what is in Jeremiah 3, verse 4. Probably it's the word Abba. So he, 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 he called God, he called God his father. Abba. And that's how we're told New Testament. It's by the Holy Spirit that Believers, you are for believers. You call God Abba, Father. What a privilege. Now, I'm, I, I was going to say something else, and I don't have time to do it. might have to leave that. But uh, th 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 there we have, th there we have, th there we have this, <laughs> this truth, this truth, this teaching regarding God. There are those who believe that God is a distant God. Oh, he may, have, he may exist. And he may have created the world. But after creating the world, he left the world, as it were, just like winding up a clock. And once you've wound up a clock, you just leave it to run. That's what some people, they were called deists. Sadly, they were in our own country. Sadly, they weren't the majority, but they did exist. Still do exist. 
He's a distant God. How, how contrary that is to Scripture. A distant God. He is a Father in heaven. And we have here, and I hadn't really prepared enough on this, but we have here what that means. The kindness of God, the goodness of God which goes far beyond the goodness of the best of human parents. Because this God is an omnipotent God, and this Father is an omnipotent Father. There is nothing that God, as our Father, cannot do for us. Parents do what they can. Some parents do much, but they're limited not so with God. There is no limity, limitation with God. With God, all, with God all things are possible. And that is ever why you and I with prayer and supplication should make our requests known unto God. Well, it's good when other people help us. We've all been helped in life. We said we've all been helped in life and at some stage of our life we've been dependent. We've been dependent on other people. But the help of man is good, but... The help of man has limit, is, is limited. And instead of going to God as the last resort, as we often do, we should go to God. Remember what the psalmist says. I, he says, I will go to God, my chiefest joy. Now, there's more that perhaps could be said, but I didn't intend to, to spend so much time on this. And uh, it's just about finish your time so we may just close it there but um, there's a lot how much we can learn from the very first words of the Lord's prayer our father we did talk about God's name being hallowed but our father what blessings what truths there are, what blessings there are. now we, we're discussing that and we are perhaps understanding it to some extent. But this, again, comes back to application. It's to be applied. If you're a believer, this is a reality. This is a reality. There are children here. They know who their parents are. They know what their parents do for them. It's not just an idea they have in their mind. They know it. They know the reality of it. That's, if you're a believer, that should be true of you and I. It's not just an idea. It's not just what the Bible is telling us. Well, that's, that's where it is. That's what it rests upon. But it's a reality. At this moment in time, God is our Father in heaven. And he has pity upon us. He knows, he, 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 he knows your, there's, there's verses that apply to this and they're escaping me. He, he knows your condition. He remembers that you are dust. He knows your, your weakness. He knows your fears. He knows them. But he has pity. He, he, he pities you. And he undertakes for you. His strength is, made, is being made perfect in your weakness. A parent cannot do that for a, a parent can, can, can encourage a child, does encourage a child, comfort a child, sympathize, but they cannot actually give them strength. Encouragement is a form of strength, but God actually gives us strength, inward strength, so that we are more than conquerors. That's the reality. And that's why is that? It's because God is our Father. It is undertaken. And He is working everything for good for us. And you and I receive it, we receive it. Sometimes we don't. But when we don't, we believe it. We must believe it. Well, we will we'll leave, leave it there. But what about each one of us here? Can each one of us here say that? 
Can, can you refer to God as your Father? Can you have, do you have the confession which, uh, which Jeremiah had? Jeremiah, Old Testament saint, my Father, thou art the guide of my youth. My Father. That's what believers say. They can say it because it's true. And it is through the gospel, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were not by nature, you were an enemy of God. By, you were not part of the family of God. By creation you were, but you weren't part of the family. You were, well put it this way. Or be careful what we're saying. Well, the Bible says it. You should have said this. There's much we could say about it. How do we, we'll close with this. How do you know you're a member of the family of God? There are, there are tests, and we should have said, there's a, there are tests. I'm just going to mention one test. If you are without chastening, if you're not being corrected or chastened by God, then we'll use the word in the Bible, then are you bastards and not sons. In other words, if you commit sin, which you do and I do, but if you go on in sin uncorrected, unrebuked, unchastised, then you are not adopted. You're not a child of God by adoption. God will not allow his children to continue in sin without chastening. If you are without chastening, then are we bastards, not sons. Because he rebukes, he chastises, he corrects every son that he receives. That's a mark. Is your life still characterized by sin under the power of sin? Oh, there's some sins you don't commit, you wouldn't commit. Perhaps you'd hope you wouldn't commit. But there's other sins that you do commit because you don't, and you don't think they're so serious. Every sin is serious. Every sin desires, deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and in that which is to come. But if that is true of you, you're living in sin, you're not a child of God. Because you haven't been chastised. You haven't been rebuked. You haven't been correct. You haven't been disciplined. How thankful I am that God doesn't allow me to continue in sin. Oh, I do sin. But he doesn't allow me to continue in sin. He rebukes me. He corrects me. Because he chastises every son that he receives. It's a mark of his love. It's a mark of being a member of the family of God, being chastised for your sin. And you should be thankful for that. That's a token of the love of God that you are adopted into his family. May that be true of each one of us. And we know it's through the gospel that you, we become members of the family of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But may God bless these thoughts upon his word. Shall we now sing in conclusion in Psalm, once again in Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and singing from verse 33. Psalm 119 and singing from verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the perfect way of thy precepts divine. And to observe it to the end as shall my heart incline. Give understanding unto me, so keep thy law shall I. Yea, even with my whole heart I shall observe it carefully. So on the whole of that section, teach me, O Lord, the perfect way of thy precepts divine.
Pray, Lord, that thou wouldst to go before us. Help us, O Lord, to know our standing before thee if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in thy family, adopted children, greatly privileged in this world. Help us ever to live as the children of God, to have that uh, mark, as it were, upon us, that men will know that Although we are in this world, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and seek to be conformed to his image. Bless us now and continue with us. Pardon our sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.